So we're just going to a brief introduction just so the recording will be good. This is the Ethical Public Procurement CLE. Um, my name is Michelle Snowberger and I'm an attorney with the Department of Administration and assigned to the State Information Technology Services Division. Just a little bit of biography about myself. I've been practicing, uh, well, that requires math for some amount of time. And uh, I was in private practice in Cook County. I was a Cook County public defender. I moved to Montana and was the Belgrade City Court judge for 13 years. I went um, and then was worked for the Motor Vehicle Division of the Department of Justice as a bureau chief for about five years. I was then their general counsel. My last little bit of tenure with them, I was at Agency Legal Services Bureau um, with the Department of Justice. And for those of you who do not know, um, the Agency Legal Services Bureau is basically the defense firm for the state of Montana. And we also provide, they also provide lots of other what I call operational assistance. They provide assistance to boards and um, we're hearing officers. So it's quite variety. Um, and I've been in my current position since November of 2021. So a little brand new to this position. So we're just gonna um, jump in. So just want everyone to take a few brief deep breaths. We all like each other. This is exciting area of the law. Uh, we're gonna to be together for about an hour and a half today. Um, and I just wanna say that during that time period, at any given moment, 50% of you are not gonna be paying attention. So you might just get called out just to like bring you back into the room. Uh, so we're going to be talking about ethics. Uh, I'm very proud to be a lawyer. I'm proud of the work that we do. I'm proud to be able to stand between our client and what's coming at them. And what's coming at them might be a jail cell. It might be civil liability. It might be uh, negotiating a very complicated contract. Um, and I'm proud of that work. I, um, I just feel that the practicing law is a calling and we don't enter into it lightly and the people who are really good at it feel that way about it. I just yelled at somebody the other day for a lawyer joke. So everyone is quite happy to make a lawyer joke until they're the ones standing behind us, right? So let's walk into that void together into the grayness of all things ethics. Because although we think that ethics is easy, we're gonna practice in integrity, avoid conflict of interest, um, personal enrichment, treat everybody equally, comply with the law, that sounds pretty easy. I like to say, do the right thing for the right reason. Uh, but, you know, just when we get to there, uh, here comes that horrible thing straight at us. Um, and we need to be ready for it. And we need to have the uh, framework in order for us to be able to address issues as they come up. And so that we can work with that in an easily way, even in amount of conflict and stress. Because the consequences of unethical behavior are quite serious. If we're talking about a procurement, that multi-million dollar contract may get voided. There are criminal penalties, including felonies on both the state and federal side. There are civil fines that can be imposed either by a court or by the Office of Political Practice. You can be subject as a state employee to employer discipline or you could be subject if you're in a firm to uh, employer uh, discipline. And the thing that we, well, I don't know, I might be more afraid of jail, but suspension or disbarment is also um, a very serious aspect for uh, our work. So if we're just talking about what does it mean to be ethical? Can someone just call out um, a, a characteristic Oh, Michelle, my PowerPoint isn't moving. Is that happening for everyone on the, on the um, 
screen? I mean, on Zoom? Uh, yes. yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, it looks oh. good. Yeah. Uh, Kevin? <laughs> so this is a bandwidth yeah. problem, I think. Uh, so what's what's going on? Your, your they're not seeing not... my PowerPoint presentation. They're they're seeing my PowerPoint, but it's stuck. Okay, because um, you're not in PowerPoint mode. You're in. They're they're seeing. Uh, so if you start your PowerPoint from the beginning as as a presenter, so over in the far left, you see play from beginning. Do you see play from beginning? No, because I'm sharing my screen. So hold on a minute. Go ahead. Yeah, I think you might be sharing the wrong screen. Or the wrong window. Oh, I see. Hold on. I'm just going to close out of my PowerPoint and come back in. I don't know what's happening. That that probably easier. But now we see you. So you're going to have to share again. Yeah, but don't I have to open my PowerPoint first? Yes, it's easier to do that. Yes, you're right. And then go ahead and uh, just share your entire screen, and then we'll try it that way. That might be better. I apologize to everybody. See, there's a reason why I'm over here. This. Slide show. We're going to start from the beginning. And now this is on PowerPoint, but I need to get to Zoom. Now hit escape. Oh. Uh, escape doesn't do anything, but if I minimize it, I can get out. There you go. That'll work. And then I'm up here in my Zoom call. And what do I and need to do? Down in the bottom, you want to do your share. And let's just share the entire screen. And then when you open up your presentation, there you, um, you'll be good. Oh, thank you, everybody. Glad I caught that not too far in. There you go. Now, can you advance those? Yep. yep. Okay. This, is, this is our... Uh, I spent a little bit of time in my life on the East Coast, and this was one of my favorite expressions, wicked. I just, I don't know. Um, so here are the consequences of unethical behavior. The contract may be voided, criminal penalties, civil fines, employer discipline, and suspension or disbarment. So we now want to think about what does it mean to be ethical? Can someone throw out a trait or a characteristic of what ethical behavior would be? Truthful. Truthful. That's it. We just have to be truthful. Honest. Honest. Follow the rules of professional responsibility. Apply. Uh, 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 lawful. Transparent. Transparent. Unbiased. Unbiased. So we could go on and on and on about what that means. I kind of chose these six, um, uh, but we've touched on just about every one of them here. When we start talking about ethical behavior, we can identify it. We can go, that's ethical. That person is acting in an ethical manner. Uh, so if it's so easy to understand ethical behavior, why is it so hard to do it? What makes it so complicated sometimes when things are coming at us and we are saying, what the heck is happening now? How did I get myself into this? And more importantly, how am I gonna get it out, get out? So I just wanna also leave here to me, one of that is courage. To be able to stand in the face of my, not my boss, he's in the room. He would never do this to me. But some unnamed person's wrath about why we are telling them that they cannot do something they wanna do. And we can stand there and say, we cannot do that. 
or we can stand there and say, here's an alternative. It will get you to the same place, but you're going to be doing it in a correct manner. So I'm just right now, uh, Maya Angelou is a hero of mine. I'm just gonna say, she's, she's meant a lot to me at very, lots of different places in my life. Um, but can someone say another name right now who is inspiring of courage? Who inspired you? Zelensky inspires us. I mean, to me right now, I'm just like, you can't be more courageous than standing in the way of a tank, right? Uh, and, and honestly, when he uh, became president, I don't follow uh, Ukrainian politics very much, but I thought it was just a little mildly ironic that they had elected a comedian and how wrong I was how completely and utterly wrong I was. So um, this is another item that I love. I love the Montana Rules of Professional Conduct preamble. I think it's beautifully written. It's aspirational. It reminds me about what's great to be a lawyer. Um, we need to have honest dealings with each other. We need to behave consistently with honest dealings. We have to be competent, diligent. We have to keep up with the law and the requirements. And I love they talk about the risks of technology, right? Because we are, and what I do is talk about the risk of talking about technology just about all day, every day um, on cloud-based services. How's the state mitigating those risks? What are we gonna do about it? How do we deal with that with insurance or other types of risk management? and um, conformity to the law. And that the areas of conflict um, really occur in this triangle between the responsibilities to our clients, responsibilities to the legal system and our own interest. I was at a meeting once and someone says, what stays in this room, what goes on in this room stays in this room. And I was like, well, I think we should just clarify I'm a lawyer and depending on what you talk about, I'd really like to keep my bar license and some things I'm gonna talk about outside this room, right? I'm gonna inform my, keep my boss surprised about what's going on. And I'm also um, may have to take other action if you're talking about criminal matters. We have obligations to each other. We are um, colleagues even if we sit on the other side of each other, we are to treat each other fairly and to hold each other accountable for the way that we um, go through um, our practice. The rules are rules of reason, right? I've been told on several occasions uh, that I perhaps am a little too analytical and a little bit too linear. So um, the rules of reason really apply to me. It calls to me that the rules of professional conduct are a framework in which we're to operate. Then there are some special consideration for government lawyers because um, uh, we might have a situation where I'm actually representing two agencies in a dispute where in private practice, I would never be able to represent two agencies, but because we're all kind of the state that's, that's permitted. And in fact, sometimes we are the client. Uh, so for instance, the attorney general in his position determines when the case is gonna be settled or when it's not gonna get settled, what case to bring, what case not to bring. Um, and that is his decision. So there isn't even, you know, he doesn't go and ask anybody else or say, what do you wanna do? Those are, those are decisions of that um, government uh, official. So if we kind of think about those ethical obligations as our um, as the core structure, so our um, statute, laws, code, code of professional responsibility, and then our ethical framework with which we operate, we can bring in our organizational operational. Like how are how is our organi organization dealing with ethics? 
what, what is that environment? So I've been in organizations, I'm gonna say the current one that I'm in, um, where I believe everybody is working very hard to always act ethically. And I have been in organizations where I wanted to run, 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 uh, because uh, uh, there, there is no trustworthiness. There's no consistency. There's um, self-dealing. Um, and you just, it, it's just hard to maintain your own personal ethics in that situation. Because those things are going to allow us to make the ethical decision. So some of you in this room may be of an age, like myself, where we represent, <laughs> where we recognize Atticus Fitch, uh, Finch um, from To Kill a Mockingbird. He's actually one of the reasons why I fell in love with the law, I have to say. Um, he, that ability to take a case of which he had no interest in taking um, and to stand um, in the face of such horrific hate uh, and still represent his client to the very, very best of his ability um, is just something that we should all um, aspire to. But there are things that prevent us from acting ethically. Uh, and things that we're not even aware of. Is there a cognitive bias? Um, uh, these are um, if I think that I'm wrong, I'm going to change my behavior. I'm going to change the way I think. But if I think I'm right, I don't kind of know I'm wrong till I know I'm wrong. And um, cognitive bias is one of those things that prevents us from acknowledging that we might not be right, um, because we are always thinking that we are rational um, and that our thinking and decisions and actions are based on facts and the way that we're moving forward. So this is a cognitive bias is really a subconscious error in thinking that leads me to misinterpret information from my world around me and affects my rationality and my ability to make decisions and judgments. And there are lots of different types of cognitive biases and actually we could do a whole plea on cognitive bias. Um, but I wanted to talk with you about a few of them. Anchoring is where we find a spot where we're gonna start all our judgment from and we don't move from that spot, even if new information comes into us. So I kind of, um, it, it has the tendency for the person who gets that anchor in first, then all the conversations around where the anchor is. And maybe actually the conversation needs to be happening over here. So um, it's really important that we recognize that. The bandwagon effect is a tendency to do or believe things that other, just because other people are doing. My mother used to always tell me, are you a loon? Are you going to jump off the cliff just because everyone else is going to jump off the cliff? I still hear her voice in my head sometimes. Um, and that's just that everyone thinks it's okay. It must be okay. It's been, it's always the way we've done things. Um, and sometimes that fresh view or that fresh look allows us to have a different opinion about that. Um, Mark Twain said, whenever you find yourself on the side of the masses, it's time to pause and reflect. Uh, the blind spot is the tendency again for me to say, I'm right. And I can tell exactly the reasons why you're wrong. So I see it, you're wrong. And let me tell you about how you're wrong. Um, and so that prevents us from looking at self-reflective and have our ability to look at each other, at ourselves. Self-serving, um, this is an attempt to, when we're successful, I had a brilliant day in court today. I gave the best argument to the judge and you know what? He just walked right down that path and just gave me what I wanted. Absolutely 100%, I was, that was me. Did you see, it was so fantastic. But if we lose, uh, 
The judge was an idiot. The opposing counsel should have taken some ethics classes. Did you see all the shenanigans they were doing? And, and therefore, I'm not responsible for that, for, for the result. Overgeneralization is that I have a single piece of evidence or very small bits of evidence, and I create the whole narrative around that. I see this all the time on cop shows, and I'm uh, nothing about uh, our actual law enforcement because television is not actual um, true law enforcement. But <laughs> one piece of evidence, and they're like, that's our guy. Now, maybe it's only because they have, you know, 50 minutes, but um, there you go. And the framing effect is that we draw different conclusions from the same bit of information based upon how it's coming at us. And maybe that's because I can, you look like me, you talk like me, I'm gonna accept that information from you. You don't look like me, you don't talk like me, I'm not gonna accept the information from you. So we'll have different responses just on the way that it's coming at us. And my favorite, is confirmation bias. So let everyone read that for a moment. So let's now talk about um, how, what that ethical obligation, those core items that we need to think about. And so far, it's, this has been a little bit of general conversation about ethics and why we find sometimes ethical behavior to be part. But now we're a little bit going to get start getting into as it specifically applies to procurement law. So in Montana, our constitution, which is the most amazing document. I practiced criminal defense work in Chicago and I always said I was practiced under the wrong, the wrong constitution. Um, people are entitled to know how their government is working. And they're entitled to know what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it. Because we are, our duty is to the people of the state of Montana. So we have a very clear constitutional right for the public to know what we're doing. So if we're not telling the public something we better have a very good reason about why that's happening. We then have um, the Montana Rule of Professional Conduct, and we have some, some rules that are applying to that. And I've just picked a few. Um, I've handpicked them. These are things that looked at me and I said, oh, this is how it would apply in this situation. Um, and it's difficult when you're talking about a government lawyer, maybe talking to an official, um, but sometimes we are entering into that um, client attorney privilege in those conversations. Um, that I'm, I can't counsel them on how to do something that's unlawful and I can't help them do it. Um, I can talk to them about why that's a really bad idea. And particularly because there's often things that are gray can talk about what the risk of, of various behaviors are. But things that we know to be criminal or fraudulent, we can have no part of. We are required to keep information confidential. Um, we, there are um, ex exceptions. Uh, to prevent the commission of a crime or a fraud. Uh, two main ones that I picked out that I thought were most important to procurement. And we would might have to do that um, to comply with other law or court order. And we have lots of laws that allow us to talk about what we do in our, <laughs> in, as a state employee and particularly in procurement. There's a lot of law that says, no, this is all public information. And if it's public, it's not uh, attorney-client privilege, right? If it's public. There are special conflict of interest for current and former government officers and employees. So um, I represented the government and now I'm off doing something else. Um, I may need to get 
informed consent in writing from my agency that I can do particular work. There may be something that they say no to and then I'm out, right? Um, I can't imagine that the state would say, oh, you were defending me on this side and now you're gonna go work with the plaintiff's firm. I can't imagine that would happen. Um, but there may be other situations in which that would happen. For currently, I can't enter into a business transaction with the state of Montana unless I follow certain uh, provisions. Um, I can't acquire ownership into something the state ha owns. Um, you know, there are special rules if I'm um, governing something. So if I have some governance over the lottery, then I can't buy a lottery ticket. So there are things that we're looking at that are special because we're in the government rule um, about how that looks. If uh, the person of the highest authority, I brought something to them and I'm like, this is going on. In my opinion, this is a crime, it's fraudulent and they fail to act, take action, then I'm required to take action. It, it sounds so black and white, but often the way we get there is not black and white at all, right? And fortunately, since I've been with the state of Montana, I have not been in this situation. I've been in other sticky situations, but not this one. Montana rule of 1.17, um, if I'm working for the state of Montana full-time position, I cannot be actively seeking employment um, for something that I'm handling, right? So I can go find employment if it doesn't have anything to do with what I'm doing. Um, because, but if I, if what I'm doing, the person's like, oh, uh, I have a contract for an IT solution product. And I'm like, oh, I know, I, I just, I would love working with those guys. I think it would be great fun working with them. I could not do that while I'm still a government employee. Um, Montana has its own code of ethics. Our code of ethics in Montana is under Title II, um, Chapter 2. This is um, required in the, uh, by the Constitution uh, that the legislature has enacted the public code of ethics. And there's lots of, of ethical behaviors there. So not only as a lawyer do we have our own Montana professional rules of conduct, but we also have to comply with the Montana Code of Ethics. And I have not found anything that is in conflict between those two, but I have think, found things where they're not equal. So we really need, as you're like looking at that, determining what needs to happen, we need to make sure that we're meeting both those requirements along with whatever other statutory requirements we may have. We have certain other federal laws um, that come into play, particularly when it comes to procurement. So we have a lot of antitrust laws um, that we are need to be concerned about. So the Sherman Antitrust um, Act of 1890, um, still going strong, uh, is very broad and sweeping. It prohibits uh, restraint of trade. It's uh, the first item that prohibited monopolies, which is why so many of our monopolies got broken up during that time. Uh, there were some very wealthy people that were very unhappy about that. Um, and it does allow for trouble damages if you are found to be acting in violation of the Sherman Act. In conjunction with the Sherman Act, we have the Clayton Act of 1914. Um, this was seen to strengthen the Sherman Act, um, prevents conflict of interest, price discrimination, guarantees the right to sue for certain unethical behaviors like embezzling, stealing, willfully misapplying company funds. Um, and it's in four, whoops, It's enforced by the um, Interstate Commerce Commission, the Federal Reserve Board, and the FTC. 
Then we have the Federal Trade Commission Act, also of 1914. And I'm sorry, I don't know which one got passed first, but they were, I think, fairly close together. This created the Federal Trade Commission. It gave them legal tools to act against anti-competitive deceptive practices. Um, and then Montana has its own um, Antitrust Act, which is the Unfair Trade Practices and Consumer Protection Act. The Attorney General or private individuals can sue under this um, in various um, scenarios. And again, it provides that for anti-competitive and deceptive practices in the marketplace. The Montana Procurement Act, which is where I spend a lot of my time. Um, this uh, clarifies the governing law. Um, it allows the Department of Administration to develop procurement policies and procedures. Um, it, the goal of this act was to increase public confidence by giving transparency um, to our uh, procurement of state goods. It's to ensure fair and equitable treatment and to um, maximize our buying power of public funds. And the Montana Procurement Act has the exclusive rem remedies for unlawful bid solicitation or awards. So if there was something that didn't follow the law or process or procedures, um, the only remedy for that is under the Montana Procurement Act. Public procurement is how we obtain goods and services for the state of Montana. It's how, it's like kind of at the heart of, of what Montana does as a government because if it doesn't have goods or services, it can't do anything really. I can have all the people I want, but if I don't have them, give them a pen, there'll be no writing, right? Um, and today we're really focused on the, that goods and services portion of it. There's separate procurement law for construction cases and it's, um, has its own set of rules. So our integrity um, is really critical um, to that goal of obtaining goods and services. And we're accountable to the state, um, to Montana's, um, and if we wanna keep our little bar card to the state of Montana Supreme Court. So, I should have asked this at the beginning, but how many people in here, in the room here, are involved with procurement? Some of us, nice. And on the, on the video call, uh-oh, I have lots of questions. Whoops, hold on a minute. Thank you for everyone for trying to help me get to where I needed to be on getting my presentation does. Um, some people that inspire the people on the call, Lincoln, Michelle Obama, yes and yes. Um, someone out here with a state number who did not hover over their name and put their name in, but I see you CCA469. They're involved in public procurement. So the basic procurement process, if you just look what I'm going to call the happy cow path, then we'll talk about some ways that are not the happy cow path, is that we have a, we have a solicitation process where we solicit goods and services. There's some kind of response that generally happens through a request for a proposal or an invitation for bid. And then there is um, an award based on how those responses were scored. And then we enter into a contract. That is the basic happy cow path. And there are lots of ways that it's not, you can do this process and there's no happy cow in it at all. But for the most part, that's how that works. We also have an item called cooperative purchasing in the state of Montana. So there are several ways that cooperative purchasing, cooperative purchasing is allowed by statute. And there are a few different ways that we can do cooperative purchases, but I'm gonna talk about the two main ones. One is that we have master contracts in the state of Montana, where we have gone and contracted with 
a company to provide some type of goods or services. The state owns that contract. And then individual agencies can come in under that contract, do statements of work if that's necessary, or purchase order if it's just for goods, and they don't have to go through any other process. Currently, those are generally open. Those, that master list is open, I think, once every five years. It's a long process that can get reopened at other times. Um, and the other one is to use uh, a cooperative purchasing organization. So the one that I use the most is called NASPO, and that's the National Association of State Procurement Officers. And they have, uh, that's like an organization. And then they have a separate, um, I don't know if it's quite a separate organization, but a separate group that handles um, procurement. So they'll get a state that will do a master contract. And then if the state of Montana decides that there's something in there that they want to um, engage in contracting with, we do then a participating addendum. And then state agencies can come through there without having to go to another um, procurement process and obtain those goods and services. It's, I would say, um, for me, it's the majority of what I do is through um, those kind of cooperative um, purchases. So that's just a basic procurement because maybe that will help some of our conversation next. So if we think about what, as a procurement attorney, a procurement officer, what are the things that we're looking at as it applies to procurement? We need to be acting in the public interest. Now, that's um, what I'm going to call um, an accordion, right? Um, your agency might go, this is, a, this, this is gonna be great for the state of Montana because it allows me to do this, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a direct um, impact on to the consumer. It just may allow the agency to do their job better. Um, we're, we're risk managers. We, this is a big part of what we do. Contracts are an, a very important way that we are managing risk. Um, every contract has risk management in it. We have insurance requirements. We have limitations of liability. We have an indemnification clauses, right? Because as the state, we want to shift all the risk to the vendor, all of it. And the vendor wants to shift all the risk to the state. So somewhere in the middle is where we end up. But there are some things that we will not do uh, in risk management. It's too risky. We might also have um, you know, how we treat our termination. What, what things can we put in there that are going to help us? If things go bad and we are not able to resolve it, that we can terminate it without facing uh, damages. We are interested in competition. We are interested in giving vendors the ability to give us their best product with their best pricing um, so that we get the best deal. So that's why that kind of happy cow path is really important to us because sometimes we don't exactly know what we want and we need to see what vendors are looking at. What do they have? What do you have? Give me what you got. Um, and then we can evaluate that. It's important for us uh, to treat the procurement process confidentially. If I'm in an RFP, I should not be talking to the vendors who I think are going to apply for that. Now, maybe I have another contract with them. There's always these, uh, this is why it's um, so fun on talking about how we're responding ethically. But I should be looking at that. I should be saying, what, is, what are we doing in this procurement process? We need to keep confidential so that all vendors have the fair shake. If we're making, if some if a vendor has 
um, asked us to keep a certain aspect of their response confidential. We let everybody know that. So someone else might in their response go, well, I may, I also need that to be kept confidential, right? Oh, if I'd known I could have done that, I would have, I would have asked for you to keep it confidential. Or we have a draft contract that goes with, out with our proposals and we say, we're not gonna make changes to it. This is the contract. You have a problem with it, you give us an exception. Well, we're not gonna give an exception to vendor A and not vendor B for the same thing, right? We have to be open. So if we're granting, vendor B didn't even ask for it, but then we say, we will negotiate this clause for vendor A, we will negotiate the clause for everybody. So it's really important that we're fair, well, leading right into impartiality and independence. And as the procurement lawyer or as a procurement officer, I don't care what the end result is. I don't care who gets the award. I am indifferent to it because what I want is for the process to be completely fair and for the agency to get the best deal. And that might not be who the agency initially thought should get the deal, right? And we should um, guard against the appearance of impropriety. So if it's kind of stinky, we should think about it. Or if it can look to be stinky, we should think about it. Should avoid conflict of interest and we should follow the law. Because what could happen? All of Earth could be canceled because we didn't do something right. It's actually my favorite judge from The Good Place. Because no matter how hard the legislature, Montana Supreme Court, our organization try and figure out every conceivable action that could come to place, there's no way that they can figure out everything. And we have to say, we're gonna still behave ethically. We understand the purpose of what we're doing and we're gonna behave ethically because I have no interest in being canceled. So let's talk a little bit about red flags as we're moving through the procurement process about what we're doing. And this can be on an agency side or the vendor side, like too much secrecy. Why don't you want an audit to happen? Why are you asking us to change those requirements? Why are you unhappy about us saying that you have to give us your documents? Because now it makes me think that I don't even wanna be in business with you. If uh, everyone's trying to figure out a way around procurement law, we just want this to happen. We don't wanna follow the normal process. That's a red flag, why is, why is that happening? Is there something that I don't know? Does somebody have an engagement with this vendor that would, if it came out, would be completely, uh, might be criminal, right? Is so for if I'm looking at bids and I'm looking at pricing and they all look exactly the same, does that mean I need to say that you people are now barred from submitting bids because it looks like you're colluding on your price list. So we have to kind of look at those things that are coming up that kind of raise the hair on your back of your neck and go, why is this happening? This is like, when I look at this, I say, this is completely easy. I'm, if I said to somebody, uh, you should not have a conflict of interest. Everyone would go, yes, that's completely fine. It's the nitty gritty of what that is, but we can recognize it. If we see a conflict of interest, we should call it out. We should take how to mitigate that. That might mean, I'm sorry, right? You're not allowed to be part of this anymore, right? Thank you. You have lots of good knowledge and I wish you were in the room with me, but I, you can't be in the room anymore. Um, there may be something on, um, Uh, I, I just look at kickback and bribes and just go, I don't know how we're still talking about that, but unfortunately we're still talking about it, right? Um, I moved to Chicago 
um, right after about 40 judges all went to federal prison for bribery, right? Um, it was a most interesting time. And while I was uh, practicing law, uh, a sitting judge uh, was convicted of bribery, went to federal prison because he took $14,000 of his fines that came into that courtroom so he and his mistress could go have a good time. And I'm just looking and I'm like, $14,000, that's all it took? Like you're in prison and you have no life. Maybe she was beautiful, I don't know. Um, we're not allowed to take contingent fees. You know, if we're awarded this contract, you get extra money. Um, there's revolving door restrictions. That's I, I can't move from the vendor, from the state to the vendor. Um, you know, you, you, there needs to be a cooling off period. Um, maybe we're not, have not identified the appropriate funding source. And if it brought to my attention, so, hey, you're saying that you wanna use a grant money for this to purchase this, but it doesn't meet the requirements of the grant. Um, you can't just spend grant money any way you want. We're gonna lose that at the audit because feds are gonna come in and audit us and then they're gonna have to get their money back. And how are we gonna now pay for this thing that we just spent all this money on? Um, and then again, failure to um, adhere to procurement procedures. So this is something that I find sometimes difficult as a state employee. Who actually is my client? Who, who are you? And could you just raise your hand? So I, under 22130, I'm responsible for carrying out my duties for the benefit of the people of the state of Montana. So ultimately, I look and say, my client is the state, people of the state of Montana. That does not help me on Monday morning when the director walks into my office and says, I would like this procurement done. Because at that point, she's kind of my client. Now, I'll just tell everyone, just so clear because we're on tape, the director has never actually walked into my office and asked me to do anything because I work for SITSD. But I don't want to give her a bad name. Um, so what, what are you looking at, though, on what, what is that? And so that's a little bit even on what is happening with the um, um, with attorney-client privilege, right? Um, and it might not be that every single person I talk to at the state um, that I have attorney-client privilege with, because generally speaking, that's reserved for clients, not reserved for other people. So if I'm walking down and we're having some conversation with the um, person who answers the phone on the service desk, and it might touch a legal issue, they might not be considered to be my client. It may have to be a person in the, there's some case law that it's like actually has to be a person with managerial responsibilities. So it makes it sometimes difficult for us as we're moving through to see who actually are we responsible for. Now, um, mostly where we get into issues is, well, we're going to deal with some scenarios and we'll talk about that more there. And I'm going to a little bit run through this portion because I want to get to the part where we're talking a little bit about specific things that have happened or that we see as common issues. And maybe you can come up with some other things that you're like, hey, this happens to me. Uh, let's have a conversation about it. So these are um, uh, our requirements. We're to recognize a conflict of um, interest. And I'm fairly confident my um, things might be out of order. So we'll just, we'll just go a little bit. But the next slide is on some scenarios. Oh, we just had a question about this. I really would like to keep this whole conversation that I might be exchanging in emails private. And I would like you, the lawyer, to figure out a way that I might do that. Can anyone think about what they wanted us to do? Could 
we put you on the email to have it covered by attorney client privilege? Could try. What would be the problem with that? Well, once again, people are chatting away. It's legal advice, right? It's a conversation where legal advice is being exchanged. So the conversation from the client, right? If they think that they're talking to their lawyer about legal things, and that might be very broad depending on what that topic is, but it has to be about legal things. It cannot be about the budget, right? It, it can't be um, why we want to use vendor A over vendor B. It can't, it can't be um, what procurement me mechanism we're going to use. That, that's not um, legal advice. So the fact that you want to exchange information between agencies and you want to throw your lawyers on it is probably not going to hold up in court. And if I was looking at a FOIA request and it was from, you know, bureau chief to bureau chief about this issue, and I don't know why the lawyers are on it, um, I'm going to probably say that should go. Like, I can't in good conscience claim that as privileged. So what is a way that communication cannot be discoverable in a document if it's not in a document? If you want to talk to somebody and you don't want a piece of paper floating around with what you talked about, pick up the phone, go have a meeting with them in their office. Now, ultimately, it could be discoverable if you get to court but it's not gonna be on a piece of paper. So if you're trying to say, I don't want the piece of paper to be discovered, don't put it in, in your paper. Oh, whoops. So we're, I'm a little bit lying on this. Marge Brown, Marge Brown. QK, Quentin King with MSU. Uh, so when we're talking about like information that we know, right, there are, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to agree with Brenda um, that if, if I'm, if I'm having communication within my agency, um, out of anyone in that agency, the director should be the one who knows everything, right? So if there's, if there's an issue, um, I, I'm most going to probably be most comfortable. Now, can I think of a situation of which that might not be true? It might not be true if the problem was the director, right? If I'm trying to uh, do, do an investigation on HR, let's say, and it involves the director. I'm not going to go tell the director what I found, right? We got to keep that uh, separate. But if um, the director wants to know what the status is about a procurement, that's something I don't see any issue in, in providing. So there is a case, Nelson versus City of Billings, which holds that the attorney client for um, government lawyers and also work product privileges are very narrowly drawn. And that site is 2018 Montana 36. Um, it, it's narrow. So that's why just be to putting lawyers on your emails are not gonna be um, correct. The vendor wants to keep certain things confidential. So they're, they're in our Q&A board, have, have submitted an affidavit of, of confidential information or trade secrets, and they've got a whole laundry list of things they want to keep. keep shh, they don't want anyone to know. They're priceless. Um, what do people think? Can we keep priceless confidential? 
absolutely not. Uh, it, the financial aspect of contracting can never be kept confidential because that is the number one. That's 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 like what what are you charging us for your services? Where, you know what am I paying for this widget? What am I paying for your um, project manager? Um, those fees, there's nothing confidential about it and can't be, and that's by statute. Their client list. So they want to show you in their response, look, we have been successfully implemented this software in seven other states and in Australia and Sweden. But we would like you to keep that confidential. Does anybody have anything out there in the Zoom as to whether or not a client list should be kept confidential? Well, I'll tell you the last time someone asked me to keep this confidential, I did a Google search and I found out all the places that they did um, press release on. And I said, well, it can't be confidential. I can find it on Google, right? There's That's right. That's right. And the fact that it, you, you put it in another state, if I went to that state and said, give me the contract, if I just went and did a search in every state and said, tell me this vendor, if you've ever contracted with them, they're all going to give me their names. So it might be hard for me to find that information, but it's not confidential. So the question was, could we see a scenario where uh, a uh, customer list might be confidential. Like maybe it's a private company. Um, there has been no press releases on it. Um, They're not using them as a reference. It's possible that there might be something that you're doing that. But in my view, what I would say to them, give me somebody else. Uh, you know, this is an open process. And unless you can tell me why you absolutely have to tell me this customer as, as your customer, um, and that we can't use them in any way, you should just take them off your response and don't give them to us. Um, but it's the, there's very few things in law that are black and white. And we always have to say like, what is the information coming? I just don't see it. And I'm like, if you're insisting, you shouldn't, you shouldn't submit it. Key personnel. Uh, this happens quite, we're seeing this more and more on IT contracts because the um, shortage of employees, of uh, IT employees, and they don't want someone going in and um, swooping their, their, their folks. Um, I don't know, if I go out to LinkedIn and I find them there, they're not really confidential. If I can find them because they presented at a conference that's on Google, on the internet, it's not really confidential. Now I could say, we have an employee who's a victim of domestic violence and we need to protect her identity because um, she has an order of protection and she's in hiding. I might give them that. That seems a reasonable reason, but she's also not gonna be out there on the internet. It's amazing what you can find out there. Plan system improvements. We want to let you know, like we have the software, and we want you to let you know all of the things that we've got planned um, that will be eventually incorporated into our system, of which you might be super excited about. Now, I have let that be confidential. Um, that's a judgment call that I've done, but I felt that it might be unfair advantage to another organization to know what that organization is doing. And they're only telling us that to help us um, provide us information about um, what their system might do in the future. But you could easily fall on the other side of that. The types of data and the math that's going into their analytical tool. 
that might fall under a trade secret, right? Their data elements might not, like, oh, I take date of birth and like, like the five data points everybody does, um, that might not be, but the, or the fact that they have a tool, um, but the math might be, well, most likely it's. The specific security tools that they're using to keep their data safe, right? So this is actually not public information under state law. So how we keep our system secure and our data secure is not open to the public. And that's because if we tell you what's gonna happen, you're gonna find exactly a way to get around it. And then we're gonna be in a whole heck of a lot of trouble. An employee is attending an out-of-state conference that's relevant to their work. It's a work-related conference. The vendor wants to take them out to dinner. Is this okay? The dinner is under fifty dollars, and RFP, right? RFP. A, a solicitation. They're not in, involved in solicitation. That's correct because that would be a conflict of interest. But also, the reason they're taking out to dinner is not to improperly influence us, or that someone looking at it would say it's not. Uh, the perception is not that it's uh, a reasonable person would not see that as an attempt to influence us. Thank goodness, right? Um, yeah, so my, mine are a little bit, but here is um, some rules of conduct. And this is um, exactly about employee may not accept this, um, exactly what we were talking about before just happening. Somebody these comes in, your agency comes into you, they're super excited. They're like, oh my goodness, Michelle, I can't believe it. We have found the perfect, absolute, wonderful solution. It's the best in the whole world. It's only going to cost $25 million. And we would like to sole source that. So for those of you who don't know sole source, sole source is a way for you not to have to go through a procurement process. You do not have to. Um, get any kind of solicitation or do anything, you can just grant the contract. You can award a contract. It is disfavored, severely disfavored um, because of all of those characteristics that we need and we um, uh, need to do. So, um, you know, make it happen. It's probably not going to happen. Sole source. Uh, we do have that thing called cooperative purchasing and we might be able to get you there if they're out there and we can directly contract with them under some other procurement method but if we can't and there's some variations to that um, because some states who offer um, and we do this often in our contracts we have a cooperative purchasing clause in our contract that says another age state agency or even government state government so like the state of Wisconsin could use our contract as an avenue for that procurement. It makes it worse because the, you have less things you can do under that contract and they're more fixed if they're within, uh, within the contract like that. But it's possible. We can find, sometimes find things. But at the end of the day, if there's no other procurement method, you are going to have to do an RFP. That's all there is to it. Sole source is very limited on what can be done. Michelle? Oh, yeah. What about, um, like, you built this custom solution that is specifically tailored to uh, applications for, you know, your specific agency, and now you need to do an update. Do you have to go through a procurement or that or so um, there, there are two things. So uh, the question was, we have a custom built application. The contract um, does not allow for any additional build or it's beyond the contract term. Um, is there a way that we could then go back to that contractor and have them build for us because they're intimately, you know, they built it the first time. Or maybe it's actually their product. It's not a, 
it's a cot system, but we need some adjustment to that cot system and we don't wanna to have to build a whole new contract. That actually is the reason why we would do sole source um, because there's no, um, that other, the company who owns that software um, is not gonna allow a different company in to understand their architecture, um, to spend all that time to come up to speed with it um, just to make some, you know, small custom build for Montana. That's like a perfect example of why would you, why would use sole source. Uh, here's a scenario. We're putting together an RFP and we know the lay of the land and we know who we want. And we're going to make the requirements be so specific that there's only going to be one successful person. Now, often, I might not even see that at that moment because I'm, I'm rarely involved in the requirement gathering stage or the building of the RFP or the submission or the posting of the RFP. I generally am only handling things once the RFP is out. Um, but this is where you're going to get, you might be subject to a protest. Um, uh, you might, we might be looking at the time that the scoring comes back and your procurement people are very unhappy um, because they can see more clearly what happened. That might require the RFP to be done again, which is just a waste of time and, and not very helpful. I, I'll just tell you um, an agency, trying not to, to provide um, specifics, but an agency just went through, they did an RP, they were, they, they were so excited about a vendor. They loved this uh, because they knew about their services and they had seen it, right? Um, and, and they had seen it in action. And they're like, oh, we just cannot wait to work with this vendor. We cannot wait. And they got through the RP and they were not successful. And they were so much happier with the person, the custom, um, the vendor that they got. Um, so sometimes our, our blinders, our cognitive bias is going to prevent us from thinking about things that are gonna be more beneficial to the state. And part of our job, just in conversations, is to say we should ensure that this doesn't happen because we can overcome, not all cognitive bias, but we can overcome some cognitive bias by education and conversation and putting a highlight on it. We've got this massive project coming down, um, but we're not going to do it all. We're not. We're going to. We're going to make several smaller projects, and eventually, it's going to work its way into this very large project. We want to get the solicitation project pro, um, process going. Is that okay? Can we do that? Maybe. So what happens when a contract gets over $500,000? Special scrutiny. It's gotta to go to the OBPP for approval. So if you are doing this, to say, oh, we don't want that scrutiny. We want it to be quiet. We don't want people to know what's going on, even in our own government. We just like to keep it on the down low. Um, then that's going to be a problem. If what you're doing is saying, yeah, I have this huge project and I'm buying the software up front, but I can't do all the development. Like, I, we don't have all the money. So we're going to do this part first. Um, and then we're going to do that part second. And we're going to do that part third. Or, and then we're going to bring in this agency to do something, it might be completely fine. So it's again, what you're looking at, but you kind of have to always think that people are sneaky or they're just the best off if we're going, I think they're sneaky and we should figure it out. No one is sneaky at DOA. Nobody is sneaky at DOA. I'm reiterating that. Nobody was sneaky at DOJ. That's the only two agencies I work for. Nobody's sneaky. Um, how are we going to deal with contract clauses that the state and the vendor can't agree on? And what if those contract clauses are actually required by Montana law, like choice of law, right? Montana 
Um, if Montana is going to be sued, they're going to be sued in the state of Montana. Not if we don't want to be sued in federal court. If we can help it, sometimes we can help it. But on contracts, we should always be able to be sued in state, right? There are some causes of action for constitutional violations, ADA violations, of course, but that's not what we're talking about here. So um, what happens if they're like, no, it's got to be New York. And we're like, no, it's got to be Montana. What, what have you done? Find another vendor. What if it is the only vendor? Stay silent. Because we don't waive our sovereign immunity. We don't care that they're going to sue us in New York because we'll just go in and tell them you can't sue us here. Right? We have done that. Um, um, sometimes those massive corporations who are doing licensing agreements are so difficult to deal with. Google, Microsoft, um, just Oracle. I, maybe I shouldn't have said that. They're wonderful partners and provide lots of um, great services for the state of Montana. Um, but it can be difficult. Wouldn't you have to go not for the choice of law provision in the draft contract that's going out with the RFP? You'll stay silent. It, mostly those are happening not in the RFP. It would be happening in a different type of procurement method, right? Where I'm not, they're not agreeing, like, when we put the draft contract out, they have to check a little box that says, we agree to comply with the terms of this contract or do the, or do the exceptions, right? Um, so um, these are happening, generally speaking, not through the RFP process. We get a lot of people who are unhappy that say, you know, if we go through a merger, we should be able to um, assign this to a different company, like without having to talk to you. But that's completely prohibited by Montana. We have to agree to it. Um, and we don't agree to those. We, we, we don't agree to those. Um, there's lots of things on indemnification, limitation of liability insurance. Um, we are just working with um, one person business, business, one person. They're doing some really good work for the state, but they're in our data. They're, they're swirling around in our data all day long. Swirling. Um, they're required to have cyber security insurance. They can't get it. It's not that they wouldn't be willing to pay. They cannot find an insurance company who will provide that to them. So then at that point, you are looking at saying, what is the risk? How are we managing that risk? Do we have enough security in place that we think it's okay? So those are decisions that what you're looking at, um, you, that gets lots of complicated questions. Right on to CCA 469. Oh, that might be it. I'm at 125. 124. Does anybody have any questions? That's it. We have. We, oh, no. I have 10 or 12 minutes. We'll fill it. Um, yes, I have a question. Yes. Um, can you comment on um, um, the, um, organi the organizational rule that was adopted about, I think it was two years ago by the bar. So um, clearly if something is illegal or um, not in the best interest of the client eventually, uh, which of course is the state of Montana, um, you know, how does a person proceed or how would you suggest they proceed if it's, um, and you know, if it's something that you don't want to do and don't think it's ethical? Yeah, you're in a pickle, aren't you? Well, so I've, you're, I've, you're, I, I don't mean that lightly. I mean, that's why we all sit here and why they require ethics training and why we require, to me, this is the best time to look at that 
and to say, well, what do we do when a situation arises that I look and say, in my best professional estimation, what you are asking me to do, you want me to put my signature on a contract that says it has passed legal review and I've given you 10 reasons why this contract should not be entered. Right. And, and what I'm specifically interested in is that um, the rule talks about that you go to the next level to explain to them. And um, a lot of times, um, you know, at least from my standpoint, the next level is the governor's office. Right. And in, and in some cases, that is very, that is very appropriate. And you might take that uh, to their lawyers. Right. You might say, um, look, I'm having a real problem and I need assistance and I can't take this through normal channels because that would be really the cabinet and my director sitting there who, who I'm just telling is acting in an unethical way or who's going to put the state at such huge risk. That's right. Okay. Huge risk. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I think that you have to look at that. Then what happens if you go to the governor's office and they go, we don't care? You will sign that. Well, you have two choices. Sign it with a memo, cover your ass memo that says I am um, not agreeing with these items. This is not good business for the state. These are my five reasons for that. And then sign it under that condition and be very clear about what is happening. I've been directed to sign. I'm going to sign this document, but this is my cover my ass. Um, oh, sorry. Apologize. It's a CYA. Is that better? Uh, a memo, or you can resign. So, if some things are bad enough, um, resignation is is potentially what you have to do. And sometimes a resignation that is loud. Right. If if this was a corporation that was engaged in uh, illegal. Um, activity, fraudulent activity that was going to harm the organization, the corporation, you would have to leave waving your arms and screaming and saying, I am leaving under protest. I can no longer represent these people. And this is why. Um, so it might need to be loud. You're not going to squirrel away like a mouse. You may need to be loud if it is that place where you're like, I cannot work here. I cannot do this. You know, I'm aware of collusion. I am aware of bribery. I am aware of price fixing. I, actual knowledge, not I think it's happening, actual knowledge. I, I can't work here. I can't do that. Well, I, I just wonder if you did all of those things and you raised it to the highest level that you could and you still couldn't get any traction and you had to do it instead and say, I cannot do this. And they say, you have to do it. I mean, you would, I think it would be like a constructive discharge. I, I, I think that you would have something that you could do about it. As an employee, right? Because the um, code of professional conduct is not an employer employment situation, generally speaking. It's about um, the relationship between a lawyer and their client. And it, it's, although there are some things as organizational lawyers or government lawyers, but it's not, um, it's not designed to protect the employee. It's designed to protect the integrity of the legal system. Right, that's our code of professional um, regulation. The code of Montana Code of Ethics is also designed to protect the in integrity of the state. Um, but there are other laws that will protect the employer, the the employee, uh, in those situations. And I think you would have, as a public employee, who now maybe my attention is going to be messed up, and maybe something for the reason that the state is committing unethical. The other thing that, depending on what it is, you might go to the public office of uh, political practice if an uh, officer or an executive was committing the offense because they have power over uh, the agencies, public employees. But everybody might, nobody might agree with you. But that's okay. It's okay that nobody agrees with you. 
it's 100% okay that nobody agrees with you because if you're certain that you are taking the correct action, that's the most important thing. That is the most important thing. So just, oh, hold on a minute. Uh, I have a question. I, I don't do very, what about Chris? Oh, so um, there was a question that asked, uh, they wanted key personnel to be redacted, not for confidentiality purposes, but so that they could exchange people. So I'm gonna talk about two different things. One often key personnel is part of the solicitation process that we want to know who's going to be working on your project, that they have what their experience level is. You know, we don't want uh, people handling complex mass uh, tort litigation right out of law school. That's an example, not actually what happened, right? But like something that's very complicated, we don't want um, somebody with no experience. Um, that is one item um, of which this I don't think would apply to because they're not saying we want to keep it confidential. We're just saying we don't want those key personnel to be part of the contract. The second is, is that we may, you may include a key personnel into your um, contract. And at that point, if they're saying, okay, we've listed all these key personnel, uh, but we don't want to have to come to you every time there's a personnel change and ask for your permission. If they should put that in exception, if that's in the contract, like your key personnel listed in the solicitation and your response should be key personnel in the contract. Um, and that we would have to agree to whatever change would be made. If they don't want to do that, they should file an exception that says we want to talk about this, we want to negotiate who is our key personnel. Um, but key personnel is uh, for things that are, you know, very human based um, functions that we're not hiring anybody. We're hiring Christine for her expertise to do this work. Um, then you would have to say, what, what is, how does the business feel about that? Right, if the key per personnel um, clause is in the contract. And let me message. I did want to say at the very beginning, um, uh, at the very beginning is the way to report to the law library that you attended this so that they can report to the bar. And we have one last question here. Um, that says, there used to be a provision in the rules of conduct that a supervising attorney can order you to do something and you were then absolved of liability. Uh, I actually don't know if that's true. I think that there might be provisions um, where it's unclear as to whether something is ethical or not ethical. And they're like, no, you're going to do this. And you go, okay. And that might actually be in your favor if there was ever a complaint filed that you were following direction, but I don't know that that would hold. I, I think under certain circumstances, I don't think the fact that somebody, you were following orders. I mean, you know, ever since Nuremberg, we're kind of not very good at, at that clause, so. Well, I just wanna say, I think we're definitely at the time now. Thank you very much. We have 95 participants on the Zoom call. So, wow, that's fantastic. I hope you were paying attention for portions of this and that you found it um, interesting. So thank you all very much. Thanks to the State Bar. Um, thanks to uh, Montana State Library and the Public Law Section. We'll talk to you later.